Well, please open your Bible at Isaiah and chapter 53. We have two more weekends in this marvelous chapter that tells us what Jesus accomplished in his life, his death, and his resurrection. The first eight verses of this chapter focus on the life and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah tells us about how the Son of God would come into the world, how he was despised, how he was rejected, how he was oppressed and pierced and crushed and wounded. He was cut off out of the land of the living. And then we saw that verse 9 is really the turning point of this whole chapter. The people who condemned Jesus consigned him to a grave with the wicked. That's what they thought he deserved, but it's not what happened. A man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea came forward, and Jesus was given an honored burial in a new tomb. And then last week, we looked at verse 10, where the focus is on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw that Jesus will get the will of God done. He will bring many children to birth. He will have many offspring. And they, like him, are going to live forever. And I felt last week as we looked at verse 10 together, you know, this could easily be the end of the chapter. Jesus is risen. He lives forever. The will of God will prosper in his hand. What more is there to say after that? But the Holy Spirit is not done. He has more to teach us about what Jesus has accomplished. Now in 10 verses, Isaiah has taken us then through the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the natural question at this point is, what is Jesus doing now? And that is the focus of verse 11, which is before us today. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Out of the anguish of his soul, Jesus will see and be satisfied. Now, what could possibly come from the appalling suffering of Jesus that would be so good that Jesus would look back at all that he suffered on the cross and say that it was well worth it. And, you know, the resurrection is not an adequate answer to that question. I mean, think, for example, about the Holocaust. There were people who survived that awful evil. But no one who endured the Holocaust would ever dream of saying that they were satisfied because they survived it. Now, what we're being told here in this verse is that something came out of the anguish of Jesus and that what came out of his suffering was so good that Jesus was glad that he endured it. Now, what could possibly come out of Jesus' suffering that would lead him to say, I am satisfied, I am glad that I did that, it was well worth it. And Isaiah answers that question in this verse. He tells us that Jesus will make many to be accounted righteous. That's what comes out of the death of Jesus that is so satisfying to him. He will make many to be accounted righteous. Now, other translations use the word justified here. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. But the ESV Bible that we use in the church is especially helpful here because it gives us the meaning of the word justified, which is accounted righteous. 
Isaiah then tells us in this verse, here's the verse in a nutshell, he tells us that Jesus is satisfied because his people are justified. Out of the sufferings of Jesus will come a vast company of redeemed people who will be reconciled to God and will enjoy him forever and ever. And when Jesus looks at these people, well, he is satisfied. Now, we're going to ask three questions of this wonderful verse today. We're going to ask the question, why are we justified? And then, how are we justified? And then lastly, who will be justified? And then we'll seek to apply what this verse teaches us to our own lives today. First then, why are we justified? And notice what Isaiah says, out of the anguish of his soul, He shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. So Jesus makes us right with God by counting us righteous. And I want to link this today with a verse in the New Testament that I think is one of the most astonishing verses in all of the Bible. And that is Romans chapter 4 and verses 4 and 5, where we read this. To the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Now, do you notice as you look at these two verses that the Apostle Paul is using the same language as Isaiah, counted as righteous. And I want you to notice from Romans in chapter 4 who it is that God counts righteous. The Apostle Paul says that God justifies the ungodly. The ungodly. I mean, it's one of these verses that you look at and you say, is that really right? Surely it should say, God will justify the godly because they are righteous. But think for a moment about what that would actually mean. If God justified the godly because they are righteous, then in order to be justified, in order to be right with God, we would have to become godly. And not just a little godly, we would have to become godly through and through and godly all the time. We'd have to pray more. We'd have to witness more. We'd have to serve more. We'd have to give more. And if we didn't, we would not be justified. And how could any of us ever become godly enough for God to justify us? We are sinners by nature and by practice. And if the teaching of the Bible were that God justifies the godly, there would be no hope for any one of us at all. None at all. So thank God, try and take this in today as we look at the Bible and what it actually says. Thank God that the Bible does not teach that God justifies the godly because they are righteous. It teaches that God justifies the ungodly and he does it despite our unrighteousness. Try and take in this most amazing good news. God justifies the ungodly. See, what that means is God justifies, makes right with himself, people who have not lived as they should. God justifies people who have not prayed as they should. God justifies people who have not served as they should. God justifies people who have not loved as they should, have not loved God with all their heart and have not loved their neighbor as themselves. And think about this. God justifies people who have not believed as they should. 
Yes, we must believe if we are to be justified, but which of us believes as we should? And the truth is, isn't it, that we stumble along with our many questions, our many doubts, and our many fears. Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Jesus justifies sinners. He makes many who are not righteous to be accounted righteous. So there's the first question. Why are we justified? And the answer to that question, quite clearly, from what Isaiah is telling us here, is that Jesus makes us right with God by counting us righteous. Now, the second question, how is that possible? How can Jesus count us righteous when we're not? How can he justify us when we all know that even at our best, we still fall far short of the life to which God calls us? And there are two answers to this question, and both of them are in this wonderful verse from Isaiah and chapter 53. How are we justified? First answer, by the righteous life of Jesus. Notice that Isaiah says here, by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. So you see, Jesus is described here, and this is very important, as the righteous one. What Isaiah is telling us is that the Lord Jesus Christ joined the human family. And when he joined the human family, he lived the perfect life that none of us has been able to live. But notice that the word righteous occurs twice in this verse. That's very significant. Isaiah describes Jesus as the righteous one. And then he goes on to speak of the many who will be accounted righteous. So where does this righteousness that leads to the many being accounted righteous come from? Well, it's perfectly obvious, isn't it? It comes from the righteous one. It comes from Jesus himself. When you trust yourself to Jesus, God counts the perfect righteousness of his own dear son as yours, and we are justified by the righteous life of Jesus. And that's the first part of the answer, and here's the second. It's in this verse. We are justified by the sin-bearing death of Jesus. Notice what he says. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. And if you look ahead, you'll see in verse 12, that he repeats the same truth again, that Jesus bore the sin of many. He bore our sin. He bore our iniquities. That means he took them upon himself. Now, the Gospels tell us the tragic story of Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. And you may remember that when Jesus was condemned to death, Judas was filled with remorse. He really regretted what he had done. And so he went to the chief priests, the religious leaders of the day, because he wanted to return the money that they had paid him to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. I have sinned, Judas said to them because I have betrayed innocent blood. And then Matthew records what the chief priests said to Judas. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. It's on you, Judas. Your sin is on you. That's what they said. And that led Judas Iscariot to complete and utter despair. 
the religious leaders of the day told him that his sin was on him, period. And he couldn't live with it. And he went out and he ended his life. Now, who can blame him? If our sins were finally on us, there would be no hope for any of us whatsoever. Imagine for a moment arriving at the gates of heaven, and there you stand before God Almighty. And in absolute fear and in trembling, you say, I have sinned. And God replies, what is that to us? That's your responsibility. Well, if that were to happen, there would be no hope whatsoever. Carrying the guilt of your own sin is a burden that ultimately no one can bear. But Isaiah has already told us where hope is found. Back in verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray and the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And do you see, he's now coming back to this wonderful truth again in verse 11. And he says, and he, Jesus, shall bear our iniquities. They'll not be on us, they'll be on him. And then he says the same thing yet again in verse 12. He bore the sins of many. See, justice says... Well, your sin is your responsibility. It's all on you. But you see, Jesus comes to us in mercy. And he says, I will bear your sins. I'll take them from you and I'll put them on my own shoulders. Your sins will be on me. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Martin Luther once described what it meant for our sins to be laid on Jesus and for him to bear our iniquities. Let me read to you what he said. Our most merciful Father, seeing that we were overwhelmed and oppressed with the curse of the law and that we could never be delivered from it by our own power, he sent his only son into the world and laid upon him the sins of men, saying, You be Peter, that denier. You be Paul, that persecutor. You be David, that adulterer. You be the sinner that did eat the apple in paradise. You be that thief which hanged upon the cross. You be the person who committed the sins of all men. See therefore that you pay and satisfy for them. Think about this. It is very wonderful. God the Father said to his son, I'm going to put my name in, you be Colin, or my wife's name, you be Karen. You put your name in there. You take his place. You take her place. You bear his sins. You bear her sins and see that you pay and satisfy for them fully. Jesus took our place. And this is the very heart of the message of Isaiah in chapter 53. Expressed so wonderfully in verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds we are healed. The reason that we are counted righteous is that Jesus bore our sins. He carried them. Our sins 
were laid on him. And because they were laid on him, that means they're no longer on us. And that is why in the New Testament, we read these wonderful words. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So how are we justified? We are justified by the righteous life of Jesus. And we are justified by the sin-bearing death of Jesus. God counts our sins as his and his righteousness as ours. Upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, another's life, another's death, I hang my whole eternity. You have already lived the life that God calls you to live. You know that? You've already lived it because Jesus lived it for you. And you have already died the death that was due to you on account of your sins. You've died that death because Jesus died it, uh, died it for you. Why are we justified? We are justified because God counts us righteous. How are we justified? God counts us righteous because of Jesus' righteous life and because of Jesus' sin-bearing death. And now the third question. Who will be justified? Who will be justified? Notice in this marvelous verse, by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. By his knowledge. Now, Isaiah has told us how Jesus justifies us and what he's telling us here is how this wonderful justification actually becomes ours. It's by his knowledge or by the knowledge of him. E.J. Young, who has written a very fine commentary on the book of Isaiah, says that this refers to a practical knowledge of the servant, that is of Jesus, on the part of others, a knowledge, he says, that approximates faith. And faith is sometimes spoken of in terms of knowledge. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, you see, this knowledge of the Lord is what Isaiah is referring to here. We are justified by faith. And faith is described in many different ways in the Bible. Faith is looking to Jesus. Faith is trusting in Jesus. Faith is finding hope in Jesus. Faith is knowing Jesus. Jesus justifies those who know him. He justifies those who look to him. He justifies those who trust him. He justifies those who believe in him him. And notice that those who know Jesus by faith are described not as a few, but as many. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Many. See, the Son of God will be satisfied. He is satisfied because of many. He will not be disappointed by the outcome of his suffering. At the end of the Bible, the Apostle John was given this marvelous vision that is recorded in the book of Revelation. He's given a glimpse of heaven and he saw there a vast crowd that no one could number. And they're drawn from people of every tribe and every nation and their sins are forgiven. 
and the rejoicing in the presence of God. The Lamb of God, the Son of God is their shepherd and God wipes away all tears from their eyes. Listen, Jesus did not endure all the agony of the cross so that a few people could have an extra dimension to their lives. No, Jesus died so that many would be accounted righteous. He died so that a vast multitude of people would be redeemed and brought into the glorious presence of God to enjoy him forever and forever. And Jesus sees that crowd. He sees that crowd. He knows that everyone has been redeemed by his blood and he is satisfied. And when he sees what comes from his suffering, he counts it well, well worth it. Now, friends, this word many is really, really important. Think of what it tells us. Many. Many means that it will not be a few. And many means that it will not be all. The Bible never teaches that everyone will be justified. Many will be justified. And they'll be justified through the knowledge of him, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many will be justified. Many. And so the greatest question you ever face in all of your life is simply this. How can you be among the many? And the Bible gives the clearest possible answer to that question. John in chapter 1, to as many as received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. The Son of God will justify many. He can justify you because he bore the sins of many. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So we've looked together at why we're justified. God counts us righteous. We've looked at how it happens. It's through the righteous life of Jesus and the sin-bearing death of Jesus. And we've looked at who will be justified. It will be those who know him and they will be many. But I want to end on this note that Jesus will be satisfied because his people are justified. Out of the anguish of his soul, Isaiah says, he shall see and be satisfied. Now, you may find yourself wondering, can that really be true? Really? I mean, when Jesus looks at us, can he really be satisfied? Isaiah says he shall see and Jesus sees all things. He knows each and every one of us completely. Nothing ever escapes his attention. And we know that even at our best, we are a long way from what God calls us to be. So how can Jesus be satisfied? And you may have wondered this. When the Lord Jesus Christ looks down from heaven, is he not at least sometimes disappointed? Are there not times when he says, I am not satisfied. When I think of all that I suffered and endured on the cross, I was hoping for something better than this. Well, it is true that we live in between times. God's redeeming work in us has begun and it is not yet complete and we all fall short in many ways. So we can all find good reason to be dissatisfied. Christians can grieve the Holy Spirit. And no doubt we do that often. So it is very easy to get into a state of mind 
where you are habitually disappointed in other believers and perpetually dissatisfied with the church. Very easy to get there. You find yourself saying, well, God's people are not what they ought to be. And you know what? If you say that, you're right. You're absolutely right. But when all of that has been given its proper weight, this remains true, that Christ loves his people and that they are a joy to his heart. When Jesus looks at his people, he is satisfied. In Psalm 147, we have these wonderful words. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. And you might be struggling to take this in and saying, really, how can this be? How can Jesus take pleasure when his own people are still so far from what he calls us to be? And here's the answer. Because when we see him, we will be like him. And Jesus already sees and enjoys what one day we will be. So, you know, if you are troubled because you imagine Jesus constantly looking down on you with disapproval and disappointment, try to take this in. He takes pleasure in those who fear him. And those who find hope in him are a joy to his heart. Jesus is not living in perpetual dissatisfaction. That is good news. When Jesus looks at his people, he rejoices in what we will be. And now we want to become more like Jesus. And part of becoming more like Jesus is that we find joy in what our brothers and sisters will one day be. You know, sometimes Christians disappoint and even hurt one another. But if you could see what the brother or sister who hurts or disappoints you will one day be, you would be overwhelmed with joy. And that is the experience of the Lord Jesus Christ right now. He knows what we will be. He sees it right now. And as he beholds the vast company of redeemed people made perfect in his presence, he is satisfied. Let's pray together. Our Father, we live in a constantly dissatisfied world. And we ask that because of the amazing grace by which we are counted righteous through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because of his perfect life and because of his sin-bearing death, Father, we pray that because of this, you will birth a new gratitude, a new joy, a new peace, a new happiness, a new sense of praise, a new sense of privilege a new sense of being blessed in our hearts. Forgive us, Father, for our constant complaining. Forgive us, Father, for our habitual picking up on all that is wrong. And grant that we may become more and more like our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, until the redeeming work that you have begun in us is complete. And then we shall 
rejoice with full satisfaction in all that is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hasten that day for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.